Let me move on to the, uh, the area of machine learning and artificial intelligence, and we're privileged to have uh, Adam Sadelek with us. He's a data scientist at uh, Google, and he's had interest for a long time in, in complex uh, emergent phenomenon and using computational technologies to uh, provide insight into them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, let's talk about um, epidemiology at scale with, um, with real-time data. I think that as humanity, we find ourselves in a position where there's this inflection point where the amount and the quality of the data we collect collectively um, has reached a certain threshold that opens doors to new applications. And the data I will focus today specifically is um, online data, mostly coming from people's phones as they tweet. And this work, um, so I'll talk about some of the results um, my team has obtained before I joined Google. Um, if you look at this animation, it shows um, people in CL area, and each of the moving points is a user, and the pin shows their current location on the map. You cannot quite see the map here because it's too, light, too bright here. Um, but these people run around and they, they tweet a lot and you can tell what they tweeted because it's a public text message and you can tell where they have been because they share location when they tweeted from their phone. And what I would like to focus on today is how we can use data sets like this to do epidemiology. And I don't think this channel alone is going to solve all the world's problems, but real-time data like this is an important component that sometimes are toggled to the traditional techniques that can open new opportunities. And the message I would like to convince you of, if you're not already convinced, that artificial intelligence plus online data can open new disease-finding methods that were simply unavailable before because we didn't have the right data. Now, if you look at the trends in how people use online social media, it has been rising across the board. And we find ourselves in a situation where most of the adults are actually using them on, on a daily basis. And what's important is that the quality of the data has shifted as well. You know, it's not somebody sitting, sitting in their bedroom typing on a desktop. Um, the kind of data you get is this real-time reporting. And so that's why we call it the organic sensor networks because you know, people run around, they see something interesting, they take a picture, they post it publicly. And we should be able to mine this and derive value from it. And a lot of these data points have a location component, which makes it really interesting. And as a result, you um, have this situation where um, you can do not just passive measurements, but you can also do inference and roll them all forward to make predictions. And rather to make you know, some general statements, I'll focus on two applications. Um, one would be um, influenza-like disease and modeling spread thereof. And the second one would be uh, food poisoning and how we can prevent some of it. So if you look at this picture of an airport terminal, you see many people waiting for their flights. Um, but some of them tweeted before they went to the airport. And you can apply natural language processing on their tweets to figure out, you know, modulo some noise, which of those individuals are likely to have influenza-like disease. And those are highlighted in red in this figure. And you can also see that there are many other people that so far are green because they didn't tweet anything about influenza-like disease, but they have been close to them. And so you can imagine that you know, one of the red guys sneezed, one of the green guys was nearby. They travel you know, to other cities, and they spread the epidemic this way. So let's go a little bit deeper into this and see what we can do with this data. It's not a new idea. In the 1800s, John Snow um, went door to door in London asking people um, how they felt 
and then plot it on the map um, where they live and plotted this heat map of the cholera cases. And then he also had the brilliant idea of plotting the locations of the public wells. So those are the blue icons on the map. And then he noticed the pattern that a lot of these red dots cluster around a particular pump. And then he formulated the hypothesis that cholera spreads through contaminated water. And now London doesn't have a problem with cholera. And so I think we can do these things at scale now without going door to door in London, but just listening to the data we already have. And so again, this image of people running around and tweeting about their environment, acting as sensors, can tell us a lot about what's happening without asking anyone. So let's look at the spread of disease models using these kinds of data. So the situation we have here is that there are many users and they post public tweets in this case and um, a lot of times they are geolocated so we can actually place them precisely on the map. And there are other people who tweet the same way and some of them are connected through follows relationships and if they follow each other then they are called friends because they're interested in each other. And so you have the social network and you also have the co-location network and then you have the text that tells you something about what's happening in their lives. Everything is noisy and ambiguous, but that's what machine learning drives at. You, you can think of a situation like this and try to find the real signal. So that's what we aim to do. And so we can infer for these individuals their health state. You, know, you typically don't see people changing their status to, I have the flu. But if you look at what they have been doing and where they have been going, you can be pretty confident that they either have it or don't have it from their online data. But how do we do this at scale? I mean, you can hire doctors to basically look at somebody's Twitter stream and say this person probably has the flu. And we did that for evaluation, but it doesn't scale. And so to make this scale, you learn a language model that can take any piece of text and will tell you the probability um, of the user being sick. In this case with flu, but it, we also model other conditions. But it's not easy because, you know, a real approach might be to say, I'll just pull all the tweets that mention the keyword sick and I'll say that those people have some disease. And it works pretty well, but there's just too much noise because then you get these false positives as I'm sick of homework. It contains the keyword sick, but it's not a real positive. And then on the other hand, you lose a lot of signal because people will say, I'm under the weather. They don't talk about sickness per se, but they may be sick. And so you build a statistical model to counteract some of these challenges. And so this is a little cartoon demonstrating how the model might work. I don't have too much time to go into the details, um, but it's all in the paper, so I'll show at the end. So suppose somebody starts typing a tweet and it starts with the word sick. Okay, so the model reads that and says, well, it's reasonable to assume that this person is sick, um, but it's not certain, so let's say it's 0.8 score. So the total score is 0.8 as well. But then the tweet continues and um, the person actually types sick and tired. So now sick individually and tired individually have pretty high scores in terms of not feeling well, but the whole phrase is probably not. It's statistically, that phrase doesn't correspond to, say, flu. And so um, you lower the score. But then suppose that the message continues and there's off also. It's not particularly tired off. It's not particularly associated with any kind of disease. So it's, again, a, a penalty. Um, but then sick of throwing up. And so now it's a clear sentence that this person might have food poisoning, for example. Right, so this is a cartoon representation of how this thing could work. Of course, the challenge is to learn for each of these n-grams, you know, for the groups of words, how much do they contribute or subtract from the probability of the user being sick. And you do this with statistical machine learning where you basically provide the algorithm labeled examples of, you know, these are the messages that doctors think represent sickness and these are the messages that doctors think represent healthy users. and use a technique that learns you know, a robust boundary between those two classes. And in this case, we use support vector machines, but you can apply all kinds of things. The idea is that you learn automatically how to separate the sick from the healthy based on what they have done online. Now, once you have that model, you can run it on all the tweets ever published and produce graphs like this that tell you 
Um, so you run around the city and you tweet, and so do many other people. So you can count for each individual how many people they encountered, and out of those encountered people, how many of them were symptomatic for flu, for example. So basically, you know, Joe tweeted, I have a headache and fever yesterday. Now they met you. You don't really recognize him because he's just a stranger. He just happened to tweet in the same building, say. And now you have an increased likelihood of catching it from him, right? And so by having everybody labeled this way, you can produce charts like this that show that there's this exponential increase. As you encounter more and more sick people, you're exponentially more likely to get sick yourself in the following days. And the three colors are just for different experimental conditions. They all have the same exponential shape. Likewise, if you have sick friends, so if you follow a lot of sick people and they follow you back, then you're also much more likely to be sick yourself. This accounts for the fact that, you know, the tweets are pretty sparse, and so not everybody you meet is going to be represented in, in the Twitter signal, but you probably also meet your friends in real life, even though you may not tweet from the same location, just by the virtue of being friends, you're more likely to meet. And so that's why we see the same signal here. And then interestingly, um, we can put it for one day forward that you will get sick based on what happened to you in the past few days, but we can roll it forward all the way to eight days into the future and still have pretty good accuracy. And so this is quite novel because now you can make this inference and prediction about specific individuals, which is something that was not available before. And so the way to evaluate this was challenging. Um, one evaluation method was actually to reach out to these people we thought were sick and invite them for hospital to get tested. And we did that and got a good signal there. And then you can also aggregate it up at the national or zip code or county level and see if our inferred numbers agree with the official CDC statistics, for example. And they correlate pretty well. And of course, this is not apple to apple comparison, but it gives you some confidence that um, it's working well. OK. So as a result, we can build heat maps like this, where uh, you can hardly see it, but there's a map of New York City behind these blobs. And the dynamic heat map shows you over days where are the people we think have the flu in New York City. And you know, we didn't ask them anything. We just listened to what they have been doing anyway. So that was flu. And let's shift gears to foreborn illness, which is similar to this, but also different. So here we have a similar situation. People tweeting uh, with location enabled. And then we also know where all the restaurants are. And so if you're within the restaurant, we can detect that. And we can say that you probably ate there. And then later, you go somewhere else the next day. And then you tweet about being sick. And the idea is that um, this guy is not alone. Right? There have been probably hundreds or thousands of others who ate at the same place on the same day. If you look at what happened to all of them and aggregate it at the venue level, you can make confident predictions about which restaurants are making people sick on any given day. Right? So you can point these arrows and then act on it. So many cities, you know, New York City, Chicago, we have learned before about um, have these public data sets where um, past inspections are recorded. And so we were interested in what we can do about this in terms of adding this new real-time signal to the mix. Um, and foodborne illness is not a particularly sexy topic, but it's an important one. You have um, a situation where one in six people um, in the US gets it every year. Uh, you have over 100,000 hospitalizations resorting from it, and a couple thousand people die as a result of the infection. And the estimates are about uh, one half of these are caused by restaurants, and the other half by other types of food poisoning. And we would like to say that all these things are preventable, because a lot of these are just errors or you know, lack of interest to fix it on the restaurant side. And if we create good incentive structure with these kinds of signals, we should be able to prevent most of this suffering. Now, of course, not every Twitter user is going to be as helpful as this one. 
that says the worst food poisoning I've ever had I received here. And then he posts the address and the, even the picture of the restaurant itself. So for most people, we have to infer based, again, what happened to them indirectly. And so we use the same technique where we learn a statistical model from, from supervised labels and then tells you that these people probably have food poisoning, these other people don't have food poisoning. You see where everyone went and you can rank restaurants in real time based on these signals. Again, no human effort required. And the bottom line is that the signals we mine correlate well with the official statistics. Um, so let's not dwell on this graph too much, but there's a pretty strong correlation between the score we would have assigned to restaurant versus what the inspector assigned. And again, it's not apples to apples because this technique has the additional advantage that you do these inspections all the time. Every time, some, every time somebody visits a restaurant, you, it's a mini inspection. And then, as Tom said before, right, a typical jurisdiction inspects a restaurant once or twice a year. Um, and so it's quite different. And I think we can marry these two approaches to be more effective. And we ran a pilot with the city of Las Vegas to do exactly that. Um, so we did adaptive inspections where instead of the, inspect ins instead of the inspector deciding um, by some uh, process where to go, it would be more data driven. So any given day, um, they got a list of ranked places that we think are making people sick. And then instead of doing this more or less randomly, they went by that list and inspected. And then you know, we had the experimental and control group, all of that, and the inspectors didn't know in which group they were. Um, but this is the interface that the dispatcher would use. So you have a map view of the restaurants, and then you have the location of the tweets. And some of them were sick, and some of them were OK. And so on the bottom, you have a rank list of restaurants. And they would dispatch based on this interface. OK? And we ran this over three months, half and half adaptive and whatever they were doing before. And you can see that the adaptive inspections are 50% um, more effective in terms of the number of violations they find and the number of venues they close. Um, so that was quite a boost, because that means now you can expect 50% more of the city, because your workforce is more efficient. And that reduced um, the infections in Las Vegas. Now, we only ran it on half of Las Vegas, but if you extrapolate to the whole thing, during the three months of experiment, we probably prevented 9,000 cases of food poisoning and 500 hospitalizations with very little work. So again, these things are mostly preventable, and we should continue to work on this. There were some unexpected things that happened in, uh, in the experiment. So it is true that the application of AI and natural language processing on these data sets can actually save lives. And we quantified that. Um, I'll show you the papers later. Um, but it was also interesting to see um, things that nobody expected. So for example, there were some restaurants that operated and were serving food, and they didn't have the official permit, and you know, they were kind of invisible. But because of this technique, they actually caught them, and now they are permitted. Um, the inspector was able to go in when the workers were actually sick. Right? So if you imagine a typical inspection happens once or twice a year, if the chef gets sick the next day after the inspection, or the fridge breaks and makes the shrimp green the next day, probably you know, the inspector is not going to notice because he left uh, yesterday. But with these signals, you can catch some of these other problems. And so I think it's, it's really a confluence of these approaches that make it strong. And also, in the whole city of Las Vegas, they noticed a drop, a 2x drop in the complaints around food poisoning that um, they would otherwise expect. And it's interesting to think about how can these things be applied to the emerging Zika epidemic. You have a similar situation. It, mosquitoes live in various places. You can imagine they are like dirty restaurants. People who are nearby those places get bitten, infected, and so on. And so it's tantalizing to imagine how this can be applied um, to Zika. And I would invite you to think about it. I don't think there's any published work on this yet. So we talked about flu and food poisoning 
Um, there are many other things we looked at. Um, I only had time to cover those two. But just to sample it, we also looked at pollution. So here on the map, you see the pink pollution sources in New York City, and the colored dots are the people who spent a lot of time around them. And you can show that there is a strong correlation between number of asthma attacks and the current state of the pollution, and how much time you spend next to a pollution source versus how many sick days you have in a month, and so on. There is also a social component. So in here, you see a person at the center of the star that's a given user, and the color of the edges, the edges are friendship links to other users. And the color of the edge denotes the mental health state of the other friend. So the red means that they are depressed, and green means that they're really happy. And you can see this pattern where everybody on the west side of the Hudson tends to be depressed, and people on the other side tend to be happy. And so it really opens this new view of the world that was previously unavailable. So again, the, the message I would like you to take away from this is that you can take statistical techniques and apply them to really noisy and ambiguous data and get a box that actually can prevent hospitalizations and save lives if everything works fine. And it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve everything on its own. But again, it's an important component that complements existing epidemiological work. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Question. Okay. I'm Brittany Seiler at HHS. Uh, I was wondering, given the increasing prevalence and use of uh, private, encrypted, or otherwise closed systems on social media, if you could talk uh, about advancements that are being made to ensure that crowdsourced information, such as the but data from Twitter is still going to be available moving forward. Thank you. That's a really interesting point. Um, I, I wish I knew the complete answer. I think you know, the world is still evolving in that direction. And if you look at the statistics, though, even though people are using other more secure forms of communication or more private forms, um, the other avenues, like public Facebook and public Twitter, are, are also on the rise. And so I think everybody's bet is that that trend will continue. And even though people communicate privately sometimes, they also communicate publicly sometimes. And you can still ride on that wave. Yeah, more questions? Please. Can you turn on the microphone? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, now you can. Um, related to that question, <clears throat> I, I was wondering what, if this technique is, can be adapted quickly as times change and people go from Twitter to Snapchat, um, and then if it's possible to know changing demographics, so as demographics change and a certain demographic group stops using one form of communication and starts using another, um, and then also looking at, is it possible to have behavior profiles so you have a sense of not only if someone's saying that they're sick, but also of their patterns of behavior to know if they're more likely to have preventative types of behavior that may prevent them from being sick? Um, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the behavior, the models I talked about don't look just at the text, but they do also consider the other signals, like how much physical activity the person has, right, how much they walked versus driven, all this inferred from the sparse tweets that they, they issue. So for depression, for example, the strongest signals are these mobility patterns. You know, people move less, they go less to restaurants, and so on. And so that's an important signal, yes. And then in terms of modeling the shifting demographic, that continues to be a challenge. And so. But each platform will have their own biases and their own demographics, and the challenge is to control for that. And I don't think anybody has, has um, a great solution to that. You basically try to model that bias. 
and then control for it. And the hope is that if you have enough of these platforms together and you have some model of how each of them is biased, you should be able to counteract some of the biases. So for example, in our case, we built a model for Twitter and then we generalized it to Instagram. And it worked fine because a lot of the lessons transfer. And once you have a good data set for Twitter, it's not that hard to create another data set for another platform. But if you have some like, radically new platform, it may not transfer so directly and you have to think about it more. There's one more question. Please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. My question was, um, how does the demographic of the populations that you studied, for example, for flu or foodborne illness, compare with that of the underlying population in the geographic area that you were looking at? It's certainly different. Right? And that's why I think these things, it's important to realize that they should work in unison, not as isolated systems. Right? It's, you can think of them almost as independent signals. Yeah. But in order to interpret the signal, it would be nice to know what that demographic is. Is that part of the report? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't catch so it. So if, if, if public, let's say health people, you know, who are interested in preventing these illnesses want to use these types of data, they would want to know what the demographic is, right, that, that you're describing. Do you, yes. um, do, yeah. do you so, yeah, the demographic describe it? on these platforms is pretty well known and for platforms where it's not known, it's not that hard to sample them. And so, you know, we ask doctors to label these tweets as positive, negative, sick versus not sick. Um, we also ask other crowdsourcing services to give us basically information about their backgrounds and their demographics. And from that, you can compile the population profiles. There's one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm asking the same question as he did, but I, I was wondering in terms of influenza and using the modeling from tweets, um, can you tell from your data, because influenza affects different populations differently versus the young versus the elderly, and I would assume that more people are tweeting that are in the younger generation. So can you pull from the data, sort of I guess what you were asking, but I didn't really see, I don't know if I heard the answer. You know, what populations are actually getting the flu from the data? Well, yes, you can. You know, if you trust users' profiles, for example, you can stratify based on that. Um, we ran a couple of evaluations. Again, this work is quite different from all the other work. And so you typically cannot really do a direct comparison where we say, we say five and somebody else says six, is that good enough? But that five and six will be just different quantity. And so one result I talked about is that the results correlate really well with the official CDC numbers, for example, at the state level or city level. Another evaluation is the one where we invited the subjects that we thought are sick into hospital to get tested for those pathogens. And those things worked out well, and so that gives us confidence that it works well. But I don't think we'll have a definitive answer, right? All these are just statistical arguments. Yes. Thanks. That, that was really fascinating. Um, w what I see happening in the future, potentially with this type of technology, is essentially retracing the lives of individuals minute by minute almost, uh, including everything they've done um, over, over a period of time. And, and I mean, that has a huge potential in terms of health. It also has huge ethical implications and, and, and potentially generates very sensitive um, data, including sexual partners, consumption, illicit, illicit substances, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just wondering to what extent um, you're considering these, these ethical implications in, in your work. Yes, it is really tricky. Um, and so, right, we worked on this as researchers at a university with public tweets where the terms of agreement say this is fine. But yes, you know, down the road with more sensitive conditions, perhaps it, it will be tricky. And I think the real question is that, you know, what is the trade off between the benefits that these models allow? versus the privacy that people have to give up to, to reap those benefits. Uh, so, one last question, Guillaume. Um, I was gonna ask a very similar question. I think the intrusive, potent, you know, obviously the health potentials are great, but the intrusiveness is incredible. And anyone who has, you know, especially with location services and the idea that you could tell if two people were in the same place or exactly at what time, 
And I'm just wondering what the industry is doing, because I find it very hard, for instance, to opt out of providing information. So I, I think the average citizen has no idea, uh, you know, so the people complain about the government collecting information, but uh, the, this publicly available information, or then if you go beyond that, the information that Google has, I think is uh, quite concerning. And I just want, want to again raise that question about, you know, how it's used and what are the, what are the applications that are, it's being sold for, this data are being sold for, or is it being sold? Yes. So one of the unexpected outcomes of this research when it hit the news is that it started this public debate about all kinds of things can be inferred about you from your tweeting behavior, say. And I think you know, as people start seeing this on TV, they begin to realize that maybe they should be more careful about what they post about and how. And I was really happy to see that because it really brings home the message that you know, what you tweet is probably saying more than you intended about you. And if you care, you should probably change your behavior. Your, your Guillaume, uh, last question. If uh, I could ask a question of you about the uh, slightly different type of data set. You know, increasingly people are wearing Fitbits and, and measure the amount of steps they take and maybe have measurements about body temperature and a number of other biometric data that are becoming available. What do you see as the potential for these data sets in detecting the flu before you even realize you have symptoms or any number of other diseases? Thank you. I think that would be amazing from an epidemiological and you know, statistical perspective. It might be less exciting for some of the privacy advocates. Um, but you know, if you imagine that everybody's phone has a temperature sensor that can reliably measure your body temperature, I think that would be a huge progress. Um, and it would have to be used sensibly and you know, encrypted and all of that, only opt-in maybe. But again, it's a trade-off between, like, yes, we can do this. What are the costs? What are the benefits? I want to thank uh, uh, Adam and uh, Dale and David and Will on the stage, a phenomenal set of, uh, of uh, colleagues and collaborators. I want to thank all of you uh, for your engagement, your interest, and your, your questions. Feel free to come up and, and ask anyone here any questions if there is something you'd like to pursue. And let me turn it over to Lonnie. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Let me, uh... So, so rather than to, to reiterate and do a summary this late in the afternoon, I think we'll uh, postpone that. And uh, I think there's other opportunities to do that. But uh, it's a very stimulating day. <laughs> Let me thank all the presenters. Um, it's uh, fascinating indeed. And I was just sitting here thinking <clears throat> about uh, when I took epidemiology, and those textbooks had none of these terms uh, or none of these principles, and probably 10 years ago. You know, the terms used today and the processes and some of the programs weren't even in existence. So it shows how rapidly this new science of data uh, <clears throat> analytics is progressing. But it also lets us know how much more we have to do in terms of refinement, in terms of utility uh, as, we, as we move ahead. So the next decade is going to be, um, have great opportunities and we have a lot to work on. Um, and kind of as a final remark, and <clears throat> Adam, it came to mind for you, uh, is you know, one of the big changes is from government-owned data and data just for diagnostic labs and physicians and veterinarians, now available to all of us personally. And the ability to, the ability to take that and make really transform, uh, transformational changes into our own health is there. And it brings in education and behavioral changes and all of the other things, I think, as part of that. So we have that to look forward to and, and to discuss. So my Fitbit said I had 2,200 steps, and that's not enough. So <clears throat> I'm going to need to walk back. Uh, so we're going to, to uh, restart tomorrow morning at 8.30. And so if you come here, we will have assignments ready for you in small groups. And that will include our uh, folks and uh, the public. And I hope you will come back and, and join us as well. So we'll spend uh, the first part of the morning really uh, <clears throat> going into some detail and more in-depth uh, discussion and things we've talked about. We'll give you some specific questions to focus on. Come back and then do the synthesis. And we'll end at noon tomorrow uh, in kind of a summary. We'll bring all of our uh, moderators up and do a kind of a quick update and summary as we go along. So thank you for a very stimulating day. We hope to see you tomorrow morning, uh, and have a good evening.